What's going on, everybody? It is man, I already need to drink. How's everybody doing? I uh <clears throat> I just got in from Cub Scouts, was frantically putting stuff together. I caught like the last five minutes of uh Aaron Pin stream as I was getting everything set up, and then one of my tabs for tonight crashed. Sucks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to type some of that as we're doing some of this tonight, which is gonna be a balancing act like crazy, but that's going to lead into, there's not a ton of announcements for this week. So I got something fun planned for after we do our announcements. Uh, granted, this usually is not a, uh, all horror centric channel. I try to, I try to talk about all different kinds of genres, but tonight I figured that we would look back at the last four decades of horror. And after our announcements, we're going to do a little March madness tournament and it's going to be a lot of fun, but, First off, uh, just, hey, how's everybody doing? It is great to see everybody. We'll see who's here already. Sardis, glad you're still here with us. Uh, John got his February Severin to ship. I, uh, not to um, brag necessarily, but uh, mine just arrived today, and we're going to be talking about that in the collection update just a little bit. I have not even opened it up really to look at it yet. Medjool, glad you're here. What's going on? Lissa, hey, hey, Jeff. Glad you're here, my friend. Eric, hope you're doing well. Stendhal, man, you've been spending a lot of time with me today. Glad you're here. Uh, John, hey, my friend. Uh, Angel is here live, man. Good to see you on here again. And uh, Movies by E, stream again. It, it feels like a long time since last Thursday. I was thinking about that earlier because last Thursday was kind of a, this big one that I was leading up to with Mark. And now it feels like it's been... Like two weeks since that happened. I don't, I don't know why. What's going on, Flickering? And my friend Kyle is here. Man, Eric got his uh, March vinegar syndrome. I am super behind every month, and I think it's because I'm an idiot that keeps buying a shirt. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Uh, Mitchell watched Caligula, the untold story this morning. Nice. And Dustin is here. Hope everybody is doing well. So, uh, first, I wanted to talk about, a um, little out of order, but I wanted to talk about a movie that I watched this week and kind of kind of give a hearty recommendation to, to a newer movie, which I, I try to balance myself pretty well from the old stuff and the new stuff, but Fresh on Hulu. Has anybody seen Fresh on Hulu yet? Uh, it just dropped very recently. Um, I watched it live with my sister over FaceTime last night, and... Fresh is uh, fresh is special. I, I'm hoping somebody else has seen it because it is super, super interesting. Very unique film. It is... Uh, oh, man, look at that. Anthony watched it this morning at 2 a.m. <laughs> uh, fresh, first of all, there are some wild things about it. Like uh, Sebastian Stan is in it, playing the best role I've ever seen him play. Um, the Winter Soldier himself playing a, a ladies man and, and killing it uh fresh was wild because the title screen doesn't even happen until 33 minutes into the film loved that about it uh was super surprised by it um it was really well made and that first half hour is billed like uh basically it's billed like a romantic comedy it is, it, it's fairly well made in that sense. It's showing a blossoming romance. And there is a wild turn that it takes. Tom, my friend, glad you're here. Um, so <laughs> Angel, this is not a movie with <laughs> Giancarlo Exposito. Um, so, so fresh. Uh, I don't know how much of this is a spoiler because they, they have an, an art, uh, a poster for this that is going around that really kind of gives it away. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention it. Fresh is a, a cannibal film. It, it comes out of nowhere. And uh, yes, John, absolutely. It is from a first time female director, and they killed it. Uh, Michael, we are talking about the movie Fresh that just dropped on Hulu recently. That's all you've missed so far. Um, Wanted to mention this first because I did not want to forget to talk about it. It is surprisingly well done. It's got some really good 
uh, like very realistic. I, I don't want to say action, but uh, like hand to hand fighting when, you know, there's cannibal stuff. So there's people trying to escape. Um, it's a very sinister movie, though. It, it, it is done in a way that is uh, a very, very mo uh, modern and, and timely with things like Tinder. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful I'm not dating right now. Um, yeah, it is, it is very well made. It was, uh, like John said, from a first time director, from a female director, and it was from a female screenwriter. And here's my sister that watched it with me. Glad she's here. Um, yeah, fresh is great. I, I don't want to give much away because there's a lot of it that can be spoiled. It is, uh, it, it is a very paranoid movie. I will say that much. Okay couple other things to tease before we get into everything else um the next three weeks next three weeks of this show we've got some big names coming on here i really hope that everybody can come back the next three thursdays just in case something happens i'm not going to mention any names yet but uh plan to be here because oh boy um we have one next week that's going to be uh, sort of like last week where we're going to be hyping up somebody. Uh, the week after that is another individual that uh, has a YouTube channel that a lot of people really like, that I like as well. And uh, that's going to be coming on March 31st. And then the first Thursday in, um, in April is going to be maybe, maybe the biggest Thursday night of the show yet. So I, I will leave it like that and say, make sure you come back on April 7th. Uh, Angel says, Paranoid Like Bugs, if anyone has seen that. I don't remember if I've seen Bugs. Uh, it, it is a very realistic paranoid movie, is the way I'll say it. Uh, so, man, I'm surprised hardly anybody else has watched Fresh. Usually I'm like last to the party. I, I'm glad that I seem to be a little early on this one. It is, uh, yeah, it, it's one that I think once... Once word of mouth kind of keeps keeps coming out there and permeating everything, I think it's going to kind of take things by storm because it's really well made. It is surprisingly well made. Um, let's see. I think we should probably start. Oh, Fuzz Saw Fresh. Nice. I hope you liked it. it. It is really good. Oh, yeah. And John watched Red Rocket. I And as soon as I get that one in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to watch that. Eric said, oh. I didn't even realize I hit 800. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Mitchell. Oh, Mitchell's excited about Pink Flamingos. We're going to be talking about that one. For a lot of people that have not seen it, it's... Uh, Pink Flamingos is a wild movie. I'll just say that. I I'm very excited too, Mitchell. Uh, Tom says, I got some American Psycho vibes from Fresh. You know, I, I could see that. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. And, and my sister really likes American Psycho and she liked Fresh. So, yeah, I, I can imagine that's probably the case. Hey, there you are. How's everything? Uh, we're going to get straight into some announcements then. And what a first title <laughs> to talk about this week. Man, that is. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, let me see here. I am trying to set up what we are doing tonight. And of course, it keeps getting deleted. So I'm going to erase that and get ready to do that in just a little bit. So this one's first is uh, Debbie Does Demons is coming from Culture Shock Releasing. Uh, this is a Donald Farmer film, but we really don't have any other future information about this. This is uh, one that they are a partner label of Vinegar Syndrome now. And Culture Shock Releasing is kind of taking like the world by storm this year they they really started last year and got got some good hype I, I i mentioned all their stuff and it was uh you know it was pretty well done they had a couple that they just released on dvd and then suddenly they joined up with vinegar syndrome and now everyone everyone is talking about culture shock releasing with their last couple films so this undoubtedly is going to be coming out through ocn distribution gonna have probably a beautiful slip cover i would love it to have this poster as the actual slip because th this is wild art but uh yeah debbie does demons from donald farmer coming soon from culture shock releasing uh then we got some more teases from 
I always hate saying the name of this company, but they do such good work. Air 4444. Uh, they have teased that they are putting out Run and Kill from 1993, and then let me skip to this one, Red to Kill from 1994. Uh, they said, sorry for the lack of updates during this busy time. As a reward for your patience and continued support, here are two titles that we are working on for the future, More Hong Kong Madness. This time from the golden age of Cat 3 Films, the 90s, which if you have paid attention to Cat 3 stuff, that literally is when all of the best uh, titles that were Cat 3 all came out was uh, pretty much the height of the 90s. You know, think about right around like Ricky O style. <laughs> so that's uh, that, that's going to be a really, really good couple of releases from them. Let me move this over. This is going to be coming into play in a little bit. There we go. There's some better lighting. Uh, up next, we are going to talk about this a little more in just a little bit, um, cause we might be looking at cinema classics tonight, but just in case this is starting tomorrow on cinema classics, they're going to have an unearthed film sale where all of their unearthed film stock is 50% off. Now I've talked about cinema classics on here. A few times before, Cinema Classics does not get enough love. They are an online retailer, uh, sort of like Orbit or Diabolic, more like Diabolic because they don't have a physical store. But this is uh, this is a very one man shop. Basically, it is a guy that I'm friends with on Facebook. He runs Cinema Classics. They've got they've got a couple good deals. Like this is going to sound wild, but uh, if you buy seven titles, you get the eighth one free. And then it really kind of works out around that um, wh where it starts to be a, a pretty good deal. But with this being 50% off, it is going to be a lot better to entice you to come buy from them. Otherwise, it, it sort of takes a, a little more to, to go to Cinema Classics. I, I used to go to there a little bit more, but it, it's hard to compete nowadays, i got to be honest. With Orbit getting stuff so early and selling it, with Grindhouse still doing great work, with Diabolic still doing great work, and then, obviously, shipping direct from labels is kind of the best option a lot of the time. So, let's see. Uh, Stendhal says, I'm really wondering who's going to release Wong Jing's Naked Killer. I, I hope somebody can. <laughs> Nathan says, Debbie does demons, LOL. People are only buying that for the packaging. Uh, I bet a lot will be. Uh, I, I happen to kind of like Donald Farmer stuff. It, it's not amazing, but... I at least want to see the evolution of Donald Farmer stuff. I got a lot of his uh, SRS cinema titles. So I'd be curious to compare them for sure. Uh, speaking of Culture Shock releasing, they had a big cinematic void event over this last weekend, and they are putting out Game of Survival. Now the synopsis here just sounds wacky. A warrior from another planet must battle six opponents from different parts of the universe. This is one that are really, you know, it, it, it sounds decent, but they they uh, they played the film for a lot of people, and it seemed to get, you know, some pretty good buzz going. Uh, people were looking at it. You know, obviously, it's it's sort of like a B film. Not not you're not going into this for high cinema or anything like that, whatever that means nowadays. But uh, yeah, it is it is something that it, people are, you know, they at least enjoyed the other night when it was on. And let's see what is next after Game of Survival. Ah, uh, again, really slow week. So we're already on to Saturday. Uh, Kino Lorber announced that they are re-releasing Film Noir, The Dark Side of Cinema, Volume 1. This has been out of print for a while and going for way more money. Way more money. Yeah, that's the right way to say that. Way more money than it's worth. This was fetching... If you've not paid attention, sit down. This is this is wild. This has been selling for like three hundred dollars on eBay. Three hundred dollars for five bare bones noir Blu-rays. Three hundred dollars, and promptly they announced that this was coming back in stock and ready to ship in June, and the value plummeted. Thankfully, yeah, we we don't need any of those people out there raising reselling prices like crazy. Um, but yes, this is going to be a very good thing because they started releasing a lot more of these sets and people were, 
I hate to use the terms like, oh, my OCD is kicking in because that's a, a real thing that a lot of people face. However, if you have volumes two through six on your shelf and volume one costs $300, I can see how that's going to bother you. So now you can get volume one and it's exactly the same, same box, same everything else. Uh, Sardis, yes, it is a pre-order. It's going to be coming out in June. I, I don't think that it's available to buy just yet. Uh, the Kino, uh, the way they do their pre-order stuff, you'll probably be able to buy it in actually probably about the next week, week and a half. Um, but the big thing with this Kino Lorber uh, set, this is coming back in stock and they, in the comments, slyly sort of announced that they have uh, previously, we had known that they plan to do 10 to 12 of these. Now, they announced that they have at least 15 volumes of the Dark Side of Cinema. That's all film noir coming. And then they said, and maybe more. 15 volumes and maybe more. And after the, this first set is five films, and every set since then has only been three films. So at least at least 47 films with maybe more volumes coming after that. That is crazy for any type of release to be able to get 15 volumes. I I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad that they're coming out there, but I'm also really curious not to... Everybody on here should know I, I love Kino, so not, not to bash them or anything, but I'm really curious when they get to like volume 11 or 12, what they are going to be saying is is film noir because unless they have some very no name titles, you're going to be really scraped in the bottom of the barrel there with uh with, with some of these because licensing obviously doesn't work like that. They can't get it from every studio. I, I'm just curious if it's actually going to be noir most of the time. And some of these, look at that. Angel just said it too. Their definition of noir is a bit, is a bit loose. <coughs> that was the perfect way to say that. Sorry, I've been talking a whole lot the last couple of days at work. <clears throat> Losing my voice a little bit, but we're going to have probably a two-hour show tonight, so that's okay. Sardis says, do these have extras? Most of them do not. Um, a few of them have had uh, small things, but they do not go all out like they are single title releases. No. Uh, most of these do not have uh, a commentary. They do not have making of or anything like that, but Yes, uh, th they they are fairly bare bones. And that's why when they come out, they're generally like you can find them for like 25, 26 bucks. And I will agree with Mitchell here. Everyone go buy Kino Lorber's new release of Antichrist. It's the best over the top possession exorcist clone slash ripoff. Yes, uh, it is. It is one that uh, a lot more people should be watching. I, I might be doing a review of that one here soon. So this was the Saturday announcement from Kino. And then uh, we got an email from Shout Factory that their 4K releases of Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to you have been delayed. And they will now be coming on May 31st, almost an entire month later. Or sorry, just over a, a, an entire month later. Um, these are, uh, these are uh, due to manufacturing delays. It's not supposedly not anything related to QC. So... Hopefully everything is fine with the discs. Um, oh yeah, completely agree, Michael. Uh, where am I going to store all of these film noir sets? Between these and the the Forgotten Giallo sets, they'll need their own shelf. I mean, when you're talking 15 sets, box sets are not small, uh, especially these ones that use the full size set, uh, full size cases. Um, for example, Imprint they did that collaboration set, and it's it's beautiful. It's a great set. But I'm still shocked. They used full-sized cases, and the box that it came in is is a freaking cube. It takes up like a third of one of my homemade shelves in the back. Sardis, as far as I'm aware, there is no noir doc on any of the releases of it yet. It'd be nice to get one, and in fact, it, I, I'd almost be fine if on you know like volume nine or something like that they did two movies and a noir doc, but. They don't do a lot of stuff like that, at least. It would be nice. I completely agree. All right. From MVD Rewind, we got another re-release coming, which is good, because this one got a lot of buzz. Uh, not not to be tasteless or anything, but uh, it's uh, the cover is Alec Baldwin and a gun. So a lot of people wanted this recently, and unfortunately, it was out of print from Shout Factory. So Miami Blues is coming 
from MVD Rewind. And genuinely, this is a really good movie. It's a lot of fun. Uh, for those that have not seen it, the synopsis here should tell you quite a lot. Junior Franger, or is it Fringer? I don't remember. It's been quite some time since I've seen it. Uh, is trouble, and Sergeant Hoke Mosley knows it. Junior, smooth-talking, good-looking ex-con, tiptoes on the borderline of psychotic behavior in this thriller with the comic edge. Mosley's the detective hot on his trail after Junior kills a Hari Krishna, robs a pickpocket, then steals Mosley's badge, his gun, and even his false teeth. Junior's running around the streets of Miami, posing as a cop, assaulting people, and making arrests. And even though he promises his live-in lover, an ex-prostitute played by Jennifer Jason Lee, uh, that he'll stay out of crime. He continues playing cops and robbers on both sides of the law. Quirky and unpredictable, Miami Blues has been hailed by critics and the public alike as a dark, comic, cops and robbers thriller unlike any other. And there's, uh, let's see, I thought this one had some decent uh, extras, but it looks like all they got were interviews with Alec Baldwin and Jennifer Jason Lee. I don't think the the Shout Factory had any more than that. I got to be honest. Yeah, the, and the, uh, as it states here, the interviews are from the Shout Factory release, so that's probably all they could get. Uh, let's see. Eric bought this from Shout just before it went out of print, and this is another one. It, it's not three hundred dollars or anything like that, but the price went up quite a bit on this. Uh, so this is a good one. Coming to the MVD Rewind Collection, uh, it is going to be... Does it say what number? This is going to... Uh, they've gotten up there in this collection already. This is like number 40 or 42, something like that. They, they're moving up there pretty quick. And uh, again, a lot of people are going to say it's a re-release. Why would they have it? Why is that something that we should be okay with? Keep in mind, there are a lot of collectors that could not get this from Shout Factory and then it went out of print. And this is a good thing. More people getting able to watch, being able to watch this movie is a good thing, not a bad thing. Once again, at least once a week, I got to do it. Uh, Kino Lober also announced that they are putting out Seamus from 1973. This stars Burt Reynolds and Diane Cannon, John P. Ryan, Joe Santos, Kevin Conway, and John Glover. Uh, I have not seen this. I'm not a big Burt Reynolds person, personally. But uh, a lot of people seem to be happy about this. So glad it's coming out. It looks fun. And that's all I got about that one. So let's get into some good stuff. Uh, 101 Films, as most people uh, remember, 101 Films announced that they had a partnership with AGFA to put out some of their releases on Blu-ray in the UK because they were not getting the Vinegar Syndrome partner label releases that Vinegar Syndrome has, obviously, here in the States. So they are getting access to these in the UK. And there are plenty of people on this channel that are in the UK and the EU and elsewhere over there. So hopefully you can finally see some of these movies. This is God Monster of Indian Flats coming April 18th in the UK. Uh, this one is from 1973, and it will have one of their uh, AGFA slipcovers on it. And this one says, just when you thought it was safe to go back to the petting zoo from the singular mind of infamous artist Frederick C. Hobbs. This is the story of an eight foot tall toxic sheep monster that blows up gas stations, smashes crooked politicians and terrorizes stoners. In the words of basket case filmmaker Frank Kennenlauter, get the straight jackets ready. And this has uh, everything that was on the release here in the States. And what's going on, Ken? Glad you're here. Uh, let's see. So this is uh, a new 4K transfer from the 35 millimeter elements. Uh, it's from the theatrical print. And then they have rampaging monster trailers from the Agfa vaults, berserker shorts from the something weird vaults, and then a bonus movie from 1975, the legend of Bigfoot, a new 2K scan from an original theatrical print. And as far as I'm aware, I believe that's on the U S release of this as well. But if that's not enough Agfa for you, they are also putting out Drug Stories, The Scare Film Archives, Volume 1. Now, this is coming April 18th again. I uh, Notice I said Volume 1. I really hope we actually get a Volume 2 of this. Not, not just someday, but someday soon, because it's been a long time. Uh, it, it, this came out 
gosh, uh, well over a year ago at this point. I believe this was like fall of 2020 that we got the first scare film archives from Agfa here. So glad we're getting this again. And uh, they say, what is the best way to prevent young people from destroying their lives in a downward spiral of drug-fueled jubilation? Obviously, the answer is sentient LSD tabs, spiders on speed, and an ex-junkie named Flory Fisher uh, berating them into submission. The Scare Film Archives Volume 1 Drug Stories collects the best of the best educational drug scare films from the 20th century. Lovingly curated from Something Weird's vaults, Agfa and Something Weird are thrilled to present 2K preservations of these bad trips, bummers, and flip-outs, all from original 16mm prints that were inflicted upon children and classrooms across the USA. Now, for anybody that hasn't seen these, these are wild. These are things like, you know, the, the reefer madness of, of yesteryear that are in there telling you that drugs are bad, kids, okay, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, these are... These are going to be uh, an interesting thing for us to see. I, I'm glad that they're putting it out over there because more people need to see them for sure. Uh, has anybody in the U.S. watched theirs yet for these? Because I've watched a couple of them. And they, uh, first off, they are such a, an awkward time machine to the past to see how everything was treated. And what's crazy is a lot of it is still treated that way across the U.S. I mean, everything is still... Um, you know, treat it as it's going to ruin your life if you touch it, but I completely disagree. Uh, let's go to the next one. Let's see. <laughs> Speaking of, Nathan said I was taking to LSD when I was 15. Would not recommend it. Yeah, that, that does not sound like a good plan. Not at 15. 101 Films, uh, this is one that slipped by me, and I wanted to make sure more people heard about it just in case. They are getting Crystal Lake Memories, the complete history of Friday the 13th, I talked about this, oh gosh, uh, I think it was last week or maybe it was the week before on the other show on Discovering Cinema, and I love this uh, release. This is, uh, I think it's just over six hours of documentary on the entire Friday the 13th franchise, and it is fascinating to say the least. There is so much that they put into this that you just are not ready to, to watch. They get so many people that were, um, so many people that were involved that it is a, just a, a revolving door of characters coming in, sharing their stories from the sets, sharing, uh, you know, the way that uh, people were treated, how they did some of the effects, how they were able to get shots, and they go into fairly great detail uh, about the lore and everything that goes with it. Uh, Corey Feldman is in there, you know going through everything about how he was young when everything was happening. It is uh, literally everything you ever wanted to know about Friday the 13th. Highly recommended if you don't have the U.S. release of this. Um, I, I don't think there's anything new on this, but um, if, if you don't have it, this is going to be a great way to get this. And obviously, uh, Orbit will have this in stock. I'm sure you can get it from Grindhouse Diabolic eventually. Uh, this is one I just wanted to highlight because a lot of people on here like steelbooks like me. Um, the 4K release of The Untouchables with Kevin Costner and Sean Connery, Robert De Niro, Andy Garcia, Billy Drago, everybody else. Uh, this is finally coming out on May 31st and a wide release from Paramount. Uh, like I said, in 4K and Blu-ray. The steelbook is available right now on Amazon. You can get the 4K as well. And that will be shipping May 31st. And for those of you that don't know the short synopsis that Paramount is using for this, uh, in case you haven't seen it and know that it's a classic, during the era of prohibition in the United States, federal agent Elliot Ness sets out to stop ruthless Chicago gangster Al Capone and because of rampant corruption, assembles a small handpicked team to help him. The Untouchables, it, it is great. Uh, Bubba Fett, I have not heard that 101 is getting the material from the limited bonus disc, so I would not count on it. That was so limited here that I, I kind of doubt that they're able to get access to that over there. And it does say it's across two discs, but uh, just for the Blu-ray, it would make sense that that would be that way because literally six plus hours of, comment, of content, plus they have a commentary. So it's it's a lot. 
Nathan says, little boy Jason jumping out of the lake is the only Jason that scared me. Or actually, you said scarred me. Uh, I mean, Friday the 13th, it, it's just entertaining, first of all. Uh, let's see. After the Untouchables, we get another sale. Uh, this is coming, or, or happening right now, March 14th through March 21st at mvdshop.com. Arrow is having a March Madness sale, and it says up to 75% off uh, SRP on select titles. Now, this is the hard part. Like, I don't want to uh, put down MVD. I don't want to put down Arrow, but it is not like it used to be. Um, if you, especially in the U.S., if you want to go buy these titles, a lot of these, like the L, uh, I think it's pronounced El, El Duce tapes, that title is like 18 or $20. And that, to me, that doesn't feel like a sale. I know it is because the SRP on these is, you know, like $27.99 or even higher in a lot of these cases, but you're, you're not saving that much. Uh, and in some cases, the, the sale prices are actually higher than prices that you can get throughout the most, most of the rest of the year. Um, so Amazon is going to have these cheaper, but it's comparable to, to prices that you can get most of the time from other sites. Uh, I, I would especially say, I would especially say that if you are looking for these titles, Watch the Target buy two, get one free sales. And then when they do that, Amazon price matches usually. That is the best time to get these. Uh, here we go. Ryan Cheek says, the DVDs are 75% off. The blue are all 20. Not a great sale. Exactly. <clears throat> I miss the days of the Arrow UK sales where they would have literally... and and. Uh, yes, Dave, the sale is U.S. only right now, but because uh, it's this is actually not an Arrow video sale. This is an MVD sale, but they distribute for Arrow, so they get to choose that. Uh, what I was going to say is I miss the days of the Arrow sales in the U.K. where uh, probably like 35 titles would be five pounds, and that's it. And then they'd have another 20, 25 that were about seven, seven pound 50. And then the box sets would be like 15 15 to 25 and it would be incredible. And it, you could buy, you could buy like four of them and the shipping would be worth it from the UK. And then anything after that was just gravy. And you could go all in, get a, get a huge order of like 10 or 15 discs from, uh, from arrow UK direct. And it would be like uh, 110 pounds, something like that for, for a couple box sets and then a whole bunch of single titles and that was great. And, and that, that was shipped too. So yeah, it was well worth it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, well worth it back then, but it's not like that at all anymore, which is, which is sad. Uh, clearly I, I really wish it was, but, um, yeah, it, it is something that, I don't know. It, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to compare because, you know, materials cost more nowadays. Inflation is wild for everybody, but I'm going to be honest, it's not a great sale. Discotech. So a lot of other people are going to have more better information than me on these. Uh, this one is one that I'm, I'm semi-familiar with, Do Double Dragon, the complete series. This is going to be done SD on Blu-ray. So they are going to be doing their best to restore it, as far as I'm aware. And it says all 26 episodes in standard definition plus a special preview for Double Dragon 5. Uh, this is going to be on probably only like one or two discs. Discotech does great, great work for SD on Blu-ray. And they will, they will be doing good work with this again, I guarantee. Ryan, I was going to mention this too. Grindhouse Video has hinted to an Arrow sale in April. I imagine the Arrow does an Easter Carnage sale every year, and I imagine Grindhouse is doing it again. Which kudos to uh, kudos to Mike because that that sale almost killed him last time he did it, and to to step up and do it again, I, I'm glad. I'm glad that he's able to 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 overcome everything. And then more coming from Discotech. We are getting Astro Boy, newly remastered for 1080p high def. Completely uncut in its original Japanese with the full episodes one and two. English language version, versions also included. The dub version is the Tezuka Pro Nippon TV dub produced at the University of Wisconsin. 
They are not able to include the Cineloom dub produced for Canada. And this is coming in May. And Discotech is doing a whole lot of stuff. Um, this was one of their... Uh, let's see. Sardis says, are there a lot of these kind of series available in animation? Not, not a ton, but Discotech is doing a lot to fix that. So they're doing Street Sharks. They're doing Astro Boy. They're doing uh, Double Dragon. They are doing the Sonic series. They are doing a lot. Uh, Discotech is one to follow for sure. Dave says, isn't the Vinegar Syndrome halfway to Black Friday pre-sales coming up? Yes, that is next week, Thursday into Friday at midnight. But keep in mind, it's not an actual sale. That nothing will be lower priced for that. I'm, I'm going to be doing a, a video or three next week to talk about Vinegar Syndrome to explain all that. But uh, yes, you are probably, if you are not a subscriber, you're probably going to want to take part in that uh, sale if you are into Vinegar Syndrome. But yeah, don't, don't plan on it being a sale. It's basically a pre-order period. Uh, next up from Discotech, they are putting out, I don't know anything about this one, including how to say it properly. Uh, Cyber City OEDO 808. I don't know. Uh, this is coming in a steel book from the vault, a brand new 2K scan and color correction supervised by the director in Japanese with subtitles dubbed in, in English with two different dub mixes. And uh, this is going to have the same features from their previous release, which is always nice. <laughs> Oido. Okay. Thanks. Or I guess that could be A. I think it's I. Oido. Uh, Mitchell says, watch what you buy from Funimation. I've been hearing that a lot lately. Uh, yeah, Arrow UK was having a limited edition sale and the prices were pretty high. Yeah, it's not like it used to be at all. And I did it again, of course. Uh, next up is Devilman coming from Discotech. High quality upscale from Japan in 1080p. All 39 episodes in Japanese with English subs. Newly revised, cleaned up subs. Extras and other features. TBD coming. We don't have a date on this, but it will be here in 2022. And then Violence Jack is also coming from them. This one is coming with a brand new 2K scan in 1080p for the first time anywhere. Episodes 2 and 3 were originally released in Letterbox 16x9. This release includes both versions of those two episodes, and it will be uncensored for the first time ever, which is really cool. I'm, I'm glad they're doing stuff like this, and a lot of people a lot of people know these titles. Uh, I've never been the one to follow these, but it, they are doing some really good work and getting people excited about these in ways that you know I just did not expect. So... I'm glad they're coming. I'm glad they're doing the work. And from what I hear, uh, I know of at least one title that they've not announced. There's some pretty huge stuff coming from Discotech soon. Speaking of those animated series, Digimon Adventure is also coming. The original classic that defined a generation of anime kids comes to Blu-ray, upscaled to 1080p, brought to you by Astro Res. Two separate releases, the original Fox Kids dubbed version first, and then the uncut Japanese version is going to come out later. And that is coming in 2022. No date yet, but uh, they are seemingly on track with everything they've announced, so it should be good. Uh, the one that I'm excited for, and I'm not... Uh, let's see. Sardis says, any idea the price of these sets approximately? I would say for the ones that have less episodes, usually around like 30, and the ones that have more, they, they seem to be maxing out about 50, and that's, that's on release. Uh, they do go on sale and stuff like that, but yeah, somewhere between like 25 to say the high end is maybe 60 uh, on a very select few of those. Not not too bad at all. And, and you can get them on Amazon and stuff like that. So they should be on sale elsewhere if there's ever, uh, you know, buy two, get one free sales or anything like that that covers them. But this one, this is one I'm excited for. 2000's chilling horror film from the mind of Junji Ito. Uzumaki is coming on Blu-ray for the first time anywhere. In Japanese with English subs, newly revised subtitle translation, other release details to be determined, and this is coming in 2022. And then this is really cool. With this release, Discotech is starting a new line of live action Japanese genre films called Neon, or Nihon, however you want to pronounce it, Nights. There are many more to come. 
I love their logo for this. Uh, it's a really, really nice uh, neon sign. Really great um, title for this. I, I'm glad that we are getting this. Junji Ito is a huge like household name. Uh, again, I've never watched any anime or read any manga or anything like that, and I know Junji Ito. I, I've been wanting to get into, get into him for a long time, and this is going to be my first purchase that is a Junji Ito physical media, and, unless I get some of the, uh, the books first. But uh, John says, if I recall watching this on the old Image DVD, it's a good, wild movie, and that's what everybody says, so I can't wait to see it. Speaking of sales, as if you don't have enough, Shout Factory is having a Shout Select sale, and it is from now until March 21st. We're offering deep discounts on your favorite movies with their Shout Select sale up to 60% off, and it is a classic Shout sale. Uh, it is, like, there are some titles that are about 10 bucks, but most of them are in the 13 to $18 range which is better than Shout usually sells them for, but Amazon and other retailers, they, they go quite a bit lower. So, you know, uh, something that's on sale for 18, if you pay attention, you can get it elsewhere for 15 a lot of the time. So yeah, Shout is another one that just has not been doing great with sales. However, if any of their $10 sales are on your list, this is the best time to buy them. They really don't get cheaper than that. Stendhal asks, how is the quality of SD on Blu-ray? Are they much better than a DVD or is it not worth it? Normally, normally I would say that it is not worth it. However, with Discotech, SD on Blu-ray has proven to be <clears throat> incredible somehow. The way that they compress on disc is like unable to be matched for SD on Blu-ray. I don't understand how they do it, but it looks restored and really well done. Um, so in many situations, I would tell you no, but with this one, I am hearing that Discotech is the way to go. If, if you're getting SD on Blu-ray and you're interested in their titles, it is worth it. <laughs> Tom says, any word on the teaming of the next Kino sale? Hasn't been too long, but feeling the itch. Actually, for Kino, it kind of has been a long time. The last Kino sale that was a real sale was December or maybe even November. But from what I hear... From what I hear, Kino is having a sale in March still. So uh, keep in mind, there's still two weeks left, but there is one coming from what I hear. Next up, as if we don't have enough, 88 Films is also having a 10th anniversary sale from now until March 28th. Enter Happy 10 at checkout and you'll get 25% off. Uh, with, with 88 Films, they are... They're really good with um, a lot of their work, and I highly recommend their stuff. But keep in mind, international shipping is like 20 bucks, And to get to take advantage of the sale in a way that is meaningful, you kind of got to you got to kind of purchase a lot to make it really worth your time. If you're going to be paying for that $20 shipping, uh, I would say if you want a lot of 88 films, this is the best time to get it, obviously, because everything is 25 percent off. However, However, if you're not going to be getting enough, it's not worth it. It's almost worth it just to pick and choose from Orbit. But by all means, if, if you are an international customer and you've got a big list, check out 88 Films, put in that code, save your 25%, and enjoy it. Um, I will point out, too, there are a couple of titles that are on the 88 site. I think it was uh, Casino Tycoon was one of them. Because uh, Yeah, I believe it's a casino tycoon was one of them they will not ship it to the u.s for some reason so if you put that in your cart and try to check out it will tell you that it can't uh, be processed or something like that but in all reality it's literally just because of that title and if you take that one out it's fine uh second site has a couple like that as well they can't ship the dawn of the deads here direct even though you can buy it from places like orbit and grindhouse video still but uh yeah if you put it in your cart they will not let you check out Okay, the big ones from earlier today. We got Criterion announcements, and uh, it was specifically on March 17th for a reason. It is the anniversary of the last film that we are getting from them in the month of June, so we'll be talking about that one in a minute. Hal and Pressburger's The Tales of Hoffman. 
I feel like we had some people that really loved Powell and Pressburger watching last time they announced one of these. Uh, Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger create a phantasmagoric marriage of cinema and opera in this one-of-a-kind take on a classic story. This is from 1951. And Jacques Offenbach's fantasy opera, The Tales of Hoffman, a poet dreams of three women, a mechanical performing doll, a bejeweled siren, and the consumptive daughter of a famous composer, all of whom break his heart in different ways. Hal and Pressburger's feverishly romantic adaptation is a feast of music, dance, and visual effects, and one of the most exhilarating opera films ever produced. Now, uh, let's see. Flex says, Discotech does a great job with SD on Blu-ray. It's the best quality you can get on those old shows, but they do a good job on restoring it. At least they're not selling you as true Blu-ray. Amen to that. Not to mention... It's great that you can get those uh, SD on Blu-rays, and it compresses everything. It's better for that alone. You can get everything. Uh, you know, if a if a show is twenty episodes, sometimes they're releasing that on one Blu-ray, which is amazing. Mitchell says, "Never seen Hoffman, but the pictures I've seen look interesting." Uh, Sardis has seen most of Pal and Pressburger. That's uh, you're the one I was thinking of. Eric says, "This film is visually amazing, like most. Why isn't it on UHD?" The only thing I will say is the color grading and the Dolby vision and all of that that comes along with transitioning from, from Blu-ray to a UHD disc can be very expensive for certain titles. So this is one that it, it could be that, that that was the issue. However, I really agree with you. I mean, they are, they are, you know, billing this as a, I mean, they call it a phantasmagoric opera. You would, kind of think that that's like a perfect title to put on 4k i, I don't know maybe they think it's not going to sell enough but at the same time i'm willing to bet there's a lot of people that would buy it simply because it was 4k which is ridiculous i i, I don't understand why they wouldn't try um yeah, I, I kind of think that they dropped the ball on this one. I got to be honest, but uh, the movie's going to look great. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a great release. Uh, on top of that, we are getting some archival stuff, uh, like an audio commentary from 1992. <coughs> uh, we are getting a short musical film from 1956 called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. A collection of production designer Hein Heckroth design sketches and paintings, which is kind of really cool. And then uh, an essay by film historian Ian Christie. Ian Christie. Lots of cool stuff. Um, let's see. I, I'm ready to talk about the other Criterions because this is one of their better months for me. Farewell, Amour. This is from 2020. And I, I usually don't like the floating heads cover design or anything like that. But this is beautiful. I, I love the cover for this. Uh, so, like I said, this is from 2020. In her luminous feature debut, filmmaker Ekwa Masangi chronicles a broken family's journey to wholeness with empathy, empathy I can't speak, <laughs> and insight. 17 years after his family was separated by the Civil War in Angola, a New York taxi driver is reunited with his now devoutly religious wife and teenage daughter when they are finally able to follow him to America. But after living thousands of miles apart for so long, the three find they must discover one another's strengths, forgive one another's weaknesses, and bridge cultural and generational divides in order to build a life together. Told in three perspective-shifting chapters that honor the multitude of struggles and emotions that make up the immigrant experience, Farewell Amour is a bittersweet, compassionate evocation of how it feels when your heart and your home are in different places. Uh... Before I dive into why this is so intriguing to me, um, well, I, I can't say too much. So I would just say for those of you that uh, for those of you that know what I do for a living, this is the type of thing that I just gush over. It, it's the type of thing that I am dying to see. This is the stories. This is like the exact type of story that I love. So I can't wait to see this. I've heard good things, but I've not been able to see this. Uh, this has a brand new audio commentary, like. Sound the alarms. This is rare. New audio commentary featuring the director and cinematographer. Three short films by the director. Suspense from 2011. The Market King from 2014. And Farewell, Mia Moore from 2016. A prequel to this film. 
new interviews with the actors, and then deleted scenes, trailer, and an essay by scholar Tiana Reed. Uh, yes, loving, loving this. Next one. Again, beautiful cover. <laughs> Coming on June 21st from Criterion Rouge from 1987. Canto pop superstars Anita Mui and Leslie Chung display the androgynous magnetism that made them icons as doomed lovers in this emblematic film of Hong Kong's second new wave, directed by pioneering queer melodrama master Stanley Kwan. Rouge bridges past and present in its tragic romance between a humble courtesan and the wayward scion of a wealthy family who embraced death by suicide pact amid the opulent tea houses of 1930s Hong Kong. Fifty years later, she returns to the sea state to find him drawing a young contemporary couple into her quest to rekindle a passion that may be as illusory as time itself. With its lush mise-en-scene and transcendentally melancholy mood, this sensuous ghost story is an exquisite, enduringly resonant elegy for both lost love and vanishing history. Again, another one that I am dying to see. Uh, let's see. Bubba Fett says, I picked up Red Shoes 4K in the Flash Hill. I've never seen any of their films. Wow. Uh, Hilton says Red Shoes may have undersold in 4K. I, I agree. It probably did because if I remember right, the blue didn't release all that long ago. So maybe less people picked it up. But again, I, I don't get it. If you're announcing a new title from them and you're really ham hammering yeah that's what i was looking for if you're really hammering home the visuals give us the visuals <laughs> tom i agree say what you will about uh, criterion but their their copy is exquisite so this has a new 4k restoration approved by the director uh new conversation not a commentary but conversation between kwan and filmmaker sasha chuk uh, Yang and Yin, Gender and Chinese Cinema, a 1997 documentary by Quan exploring the representation of queerness and LGBT identity in Chinese film. That sounds exciting as hell. Yeah, I, I would love to see this. Uh, a 1997 memoir film by Quan about his Hong Kong identity. Again, lots of Hong Kong cinema right now. That, that is always a good thing. The more that we get it now, the, the better chance that we have of preserving it because of all the changes and all the laws. So hopefully this is one of many more to come. But the big title, at least for me this month, I love this film. And if you haven't seen it, you better ask your mama. Uh, coming on June 21st in 4K and Blu-ray from Criterion Shaft from 1971. Most people know about Shaft, so I'm not going to read through the whole uh, synopsis here. But the really cool parts about Shaft are in the extras here. So let's go over that. New 4K digital restoration, alternate uncompressed stereo soundtrack remastered. Uh, in the 4K, there's one 4K disc of the film presented in Dolby Vision HDR and two Blu-rays. One with the film, one with special features. Uh, the really cool thing here, they are also including Shaft's big score, the 1972 follow-up to Shaft by the director Gordon Parks, and then a new documentary on the making of Shaft featuring curator Rhea L. Combs, film scholar Raquel J. Gates, filmmaker Nelson George, and music scholar Shauna L. Redmond. Fascinating. That, that sounds great. Uh, and then behind-the-scenes program featuring Parks, actor Richard Rantree, and musician Isaac Hayes. Archival interviews with Hayes, Parks, and Rantree, and new interviews with the costume designer, New program on the Black Detective and the Legacy of John Shaft, featuring uh, scholar Kinohi Nishikawa and novelist Walter Mosley. And then A Complicated Man, the Shaft Legacy from 2019. There is so much on this. Plus, an essay by film scholar Amy Abugo Anguri. I probably just butchered that last name. But, man, this is, this is a great, great release. I, I rarely say that. Clearly, rarely say that about Criterion, but again, this is a great month for me. Uh, I am, I'm sort of sad because uh, I just recently got the Warner Archive Shaft. Uh, what is it? I think it's a, is it a triple feature? 
I, I, I'm pretty sure somebody else will pipe in here, but yeah, I, I think it's a triple feature um, where it's got uh, the the two that are included here and then the Shaft in Africa film. Uh, either way, I'm glad we're getting this. I'm glad that this is getting a really nice upgrade and that it's 4K and it could bode well for other uh, Warner Brothers films coming to uh, Criterion in an upgrade that's previously come out on Warner Archive. So we'll see. Two more coming from Criterion in June. On the 28th, we are getting The Worst Person in the World from 2021. Uh, the actor in this won the Best Actress Prize at Cannes for the revelatory complex performance that anchors this sprawlingly novelistic film by Norwegian auteur Joachim Trier, an emotionally, int <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> emotionally intricate and exhilarating character study of a woman entering her 30s. Amid the seemingly endless possibilities of the modern world, Julie vacillates between artistic passions and professions. The question of motherhood and relationships with two very different men, a successful comic book artist, and a charismatic barista. Working with the team of longtime collaborators, Trier and his perennial co-writer construct in The Worst Person in the World the Oscar-nominated third entry in their unofficial Oslo trilogy, a liberating portrait of self-discovery and a bracingly contemporary spin on the romantic comedy. I have heard great things about this. Uh, Bubba Fett says that Warner Archive I was talking about was a triple, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I've heard this is great. Uh, the art is decent. I, I think that all of the art this month from Criterion is actually surprisingly good for the most part. And uh, yeah, I don't know anything else about this one. The extras on this, new interviews with a lot of people, but other than that, not a whole lot. Deleted scenes, an essay, onset footage. Which, I mean, it's more than it could be, for sure. There's there's enough on there. But, <laughs> let's talk about everybody's favorite that wanted to talk about this tonight. John Waters is giving us Pink Flamingos on Criterion. Uh, let's see. I can make this uh, center stage here. Without me involved, John Waters made bad taste perversely transcendent with the forever shocking counterculture sensation Pink Flamingos, his most infamous and daring cinematic transgression. Ultra Diva Divine is iconic as the wanted criminal hiding out with her family of degenerates in a trailer outside Baltimore while reveling in her tabloid notoriety as the filthiest person alive. When a pair of sociopaths with the habit of kidnapping women in order to impregnate them attempt to challenge her title, Divine resolves to show them and the world the true meaning of the word filthy. And uh, this movie del <laughs> delivers on filthy. Uh, incest, cannibalism, shrimping, and film history's most legendary gross-out ending, Waters and his merry band of Dreamlanders leave no taboo unsmashed in this gleefully subversive ode to outsiderhood in which camp spectacle and pitch-black satire are wielded in an all-out assault on respectability. Uh, I mean... Pink Flamingos. This is this is a title a lot of people love. This is a lot of people. Uh, this is a title a lot of people hate, and some people like Ryan uh, just can't get into John Waters. And I get that. Um, John Waters is a. Uh, uh, there's not even many good words to use. John Waters is kind of weird. He's out there for sure. John Waters is really good at what he does. John Waters is a, uh, he is a visionary for sure. And, and I mean that in, in absolutely complimentary ways. He, he sees things and puts it into perspective that only in, in many cases that he can really get and want to share with the world. But let's dive into the extras here. New 4K digital restoration supervised by John Waters. Two audio commentaries. Unfortunately, they are both archival. Uh, one is from the 1997 Criterion Laserdisc and the 2001 DVD release. New conversation between Waters and filmmaker Jim Jarmusch. That's pretty cool. Tour of the film's Baltimore locations led by Waters. Deleted scenes, alternate takes, and on-set footage. Trailer, English subs, and more. Plus, an essay by critic Howard Hampton and a piece by actor and author Cookie Mueller about the making of the film from her 1990 book, Walking Through Clearwater in a Pool Painted Black. 
Lots of stuff on here. <laughs> Which Criterion has done quite a few waters. So I'm glad they're adding this one. Uh, this was only available on DVD from Warner Archive for the longest time. Stendhal, most people would say that their favorite is Crybaby, I think. Uh, the only Waters film uh, Nathan kind of liked was Serial Mom. Serial Mom is really good. Flickering says, can't wait to pick up Pink Flamingos. It disturbed me the first time I saw it as a freshman in college and loved it as a senior. Man, doesn't that... <laughs> that is the perfect allegory for college. Come in, you know, thinking that it's disturbing, leaving, just appreciating it. I completely get that. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Anthony says... All dog owners must see it. John Waters is simply amazing. Um, yeah, this is oh yeah, hairspray was great too. I think we got one left. Uh, so this is Rave coming out from Scream Team Releasing. This is a company that I have uh, sort of championed for a few years. Not a lot of people pay attention to. They are very small and indie. They've done things like uh, The Barn, got some good attention from them. They did, they should be pretty close. Of course, they're right behind me. Never mind. Uh, that, that would be rather awkward to look at. But um, yeah, they've done quite a lot of great things. And they, well, I won't say great things. And I'm not putting them down, but they are low budget indie horror for the most part. Um, not that the acting is low budget. I, I think that for the most part, it's actually surprisingly good. But uh, the rave is available. And here is, they are doing two different, it is a reversible cover. There is uh, the one that will be on it, and then that's the reverse side. And the synopsis on this one says, uh, the local underground club is shutting down, but not before throwing one last party. Mimi, who is Isabel Grill from Midsummer, drags her nervous friend Lena from Girls Lost along for a night of alcohol, ecstasy, and dancing. But as the night nears its end, more and more of the partygoers become affected by a strange infection. As people start to deteriorate in the goriest ways, Mimi tries to find her way out through the club's neon-lit corridors and dark back rooms. However, surviving the night is only the beginning in this hallucinogenic descent into body horror hell. Uh, so first of all, I really like body horror. I, I'm a big Cronenberg for, person, and uh, anytime the body horror is brought up, I really want to see the film. I think that this is probably going to be decent at least uh this came out a couple years ago i think it's the 2020 yeah 2020 film and this will have an audio commentary call from the rave uh the music by the band in it making a montage and then a trailer and if you really want you can uh get an up upgrade to a signed version where the actress from midsummer is going to be uh able to sign it and the writer and director will sign it for you as well scream team releasing does pretty decent work uh i've got the link there to their website and if you order straight from them they they deliver quickly they deliver it uh safely they use a lot of uh packing peanuts kind of like severin and uh yeah really good stuff from them and i hope i can talk more people into checking it out because it is it is worth it for sure all right next part of the show we always talk about what is coming next week that you may have missed so let's bring up releases for March 22nd. First off, the Godfather Trilogy in 4K. I've got links to that in all kinds of places. If you want that, please go check it out. Uh, supposedly, it is getting glowing reviews from everyone. Uh, Eastern Promises in 4K coming from Kino. Nightmare Alley in 4K is already available at Orbit. So if you're into that, jump on that. Uh, Flight of the Phoenix from Criterion. The Core from Shout Select. Come Drink With Me from Arrow. Shaolin Mantis from 88 US, uh, Monkey Kung Fu from 88 US, Mad Dog Morgan from Indicator US, Magnum PI, the complete series on Blu ray from Mill Creek, uh, The Hunger Games Ultimate Collection in 4K. This is a steelbook collection coming out from uh, Best Buy exclusively. Captains of the Clouds from, whoops, from Warner Archive. Uh, then we are getting uh, To Sleep as to Dream from Arrow. And then the rest of the indicator titles for the month. The Phantom of the Monastery, La Llorona, uh, Time for Dying. Uh, some really good stuff. It, it is a, a pretty decent week next week, actually. You're getting that Shirley Temple title. I think that's from Kino. And then, uh, 
let's see. I thought there was one more that I wanted to bring up, and I'm not seeing it. Oh, uh, that's what I was going to bring up. Uh, the I was going to remind everybody the Mondo Macabro pre-orders. They are happening next Thursday. Or, yeah, I believe it's next Thursday. Yes, next Thursday, the 24th. Don't forget that. If you want to get in there, um, they probably won't sell out that first day, so you will have a day or two to, to jump on there. But if you want one of the bundles, you might want to get there earlier. Jared uh, has been doing very well with that stuff. But next, uh, right before I get to the fun part for tonight, I wanted to do a short little collection update for this week. I was going to share my Severn package that came in. I got a couple of their magnets uh, just to put around the movie room, Severn and an Intervision one. And I, I love getting one of their alt colors of their stickers. Uh, but some things that were in this, I got the uh, art card that came in for Perdita Durango. This was only a part of their, um, this was only available in their uh, bundle for this film for the longest time. And then they released this and I, I actually put these up as art around the movie room. So stoked on that. And then the big title from them for this month, uh, awkward question. Is that a tentacle hentai Blu-ray? No, I don't. Th oh, well, it might have on that Blu-ray. Um, let's see. Uh, the the Severin title that was big for uh, February is this Veni Vidi Depravity. And uh, the coin here is removable from the front. And the box, let me hold it this way. The front of the box here is a, a really thick side to make sure that the coin is there and won't damage the box. I knew what you meant there at the end, Stendhal. Uh, it could be. Blu-ray.com does show some of those. Uh, so for those that have not seen it yet, this is the back of this. And it is like foil gold printing on a lot of this. I uh, That foil made it look like it's scratched at the bottom there. I don't believe it is. But yeah, this is actually really nice. Really high quality. And then taking the films out. Inside the box, there's no booklet or anything, but you can see where the coin sits there in the front. And the two films that came from this, let me... Kind of got a... Uh, kind of got a sense of this one. Caligula and Messalina. Wow, I'm, I'm my hands are massive. I'm a giant. I'm sorry. Here, that's a little better. Caligula and Messalina... This is worldwide Blu-ray premieres of the extreme Italian version and U.S. cut, plus a bonus soundtrack site. And then the other one, the Joe D'Amato version. Uh, this is Caligula, The Untold Story. And uh, the back of this, I, know, I can show. Uh, standard Severn release. You got the art on the bottom there. Special features. You can see we have the Orgy of Power interview with actor David Brandon. Interview with the screenwriter, a good old fashioned lover boy, interview with actor Mark Shannon, and then deleted scenes, UK video trailer, and a CD soundtrack. I love that Severn does the C CD soundtrack still for a lot of these. And then, as part of that uh, February bundle, I can't show hardly any of this, but it came with this uh, Cinefilm catalog. And let me see if I can find. A good page because there is a lot of stark nudity in this uh nope <laughs> nope oh i found one so on the inside this is the kind of stuff that you get it is uh very detailed and it's red like a comic book really nice genuinely decent uh, and then I got in a couple of cheapies because I, I had some uh, gift cards for Amazon. I really don't do Amazon all that often. And I got in Sergio Martino's The Case of the Scorpion's Tale from Arrow. I realized I didn't have this. I thought I had it. So I, I had to get this. Um, yeah, love Sergio Martino, of course. And then one that uh, this is going very off brand for a lot of stuff that we normally talk about on here. Dogtown and Z-Boys. This has been at like... The top of my wish list on Amazon for the longest time. Got it super cheap. And it was it was basically bought to, to fill up the last of a gift card. So I'm glad I got it. 
Um, this is, uh, I loved skateboarding growing up. I, I watched it all the time. Uh, I tried to do it, but I was a tall, lanky, fat kid. And uh, it was, it was not in the cards for me. Uh, lastly, if you have been watching for quite some time, you probably know that I love Vincent Price. And although I already had this film, I wanted to get the original Scream Factory release of this. And uh, I'm going to be able to sell my other version now. I got in from a whisper to a scream from Scream Factory. However, I want to damage it. This release has an original film cell from the movie. And then also an autographed letter from the director. Scream Factory put these out. And there were not that many that got these. Uh, deluxe release with the the film and autograph and all that so i'm glad i have this and now i can get rid of my my other one so now we are to the point where i need to get the second half of this ready and unfortunately I, i've been trying to do as much as i could at the same time but i've missed some of these so i'm going to do these as fast as i can we are going to be doing a March Madness style tournament for films that are celebrating an anniversary in this year. And what we're going to be doing is for some reason, uh, I, I felt like it would be decent to focus on horror because there's kind of a lot. Uh, we, we're going to be doing 1982, 1992, 2002, and 2012. We're going to be doing 32 films, eight from each of those years and find out which is the best of the best. Now, I almost have the bracket fully set up here. And uh, this is all going to be in your guys' hands. So I'm going to need you all to vote on these. I thought that it would be fun. Hopefully you guys enjoy something like this. I need to fill in just a couple more. And we will be ready to go. I had this all set up. And then my Chrome just crashed on me. And uh, it really, really messed me up because it took quite a while to get this set up earlier. Pissed me off. Uh, so, we, like I said, we're going to be going over this March Madness style um, uh, March Madness style bracket and going best of 32. And I'm almost done. Just filling in the last couple. Uh, let's see. I wonder if I can start while I'm... No, because then you can see it. Dang it. One second. Uh, I've got one more year to finish. Uh, in the meantime, does anybody know offhand some of those movies from some of those years that you're ready to talk about? I think 1982 is going to be one of the hardest ones for people to look at. Uh, obviously... We, we're going to have to have one of my favorites of all time in there. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you already know what those is. Know what that is. Especially Sardis. Uh, for those of you that are wondering why I focus on horror, because I usually don't. It just it kind of makes sense uh, to do this. Uh, let's see. I'm on my last title and then we can get started. Just trying to vamp as I fill in the end here. <laughs> One more title. All right. Are you ready? I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go over these one by one the thing i knew that was going to be mentioned all right here we go sharing my screen now and here it is so we're going to start let me pull up uh on my other screen here the comments so i can see you guys answer nerd what's going on glad you're here we are doing uh just starting perfect timing we're starting a march madness style bracket of the last 40 years of horror for each of the years that have anniversary 1982 92 2002 and 2012 and you guys are going to be picking 
So first one that we have up here is Q the Wing Serpent versus Basket Case. So everybody type in your vote. Whoever gets the most votes is going to be getting it. If there's a tie, I will give the deciding vote. But uh, most of these are pretty damn easy in this first round, I think. There's a couple that are going to be a little bit brutal. But Q the Wing Serpent or Basket Case. Both really good, really indie, really uh, grimy. Let's see. We got one, uh, two baskets right off the bat. Dave watched In Search of Tomorrow recently. Holy hell, that's a lot of basket cases. I thought I was going to have to defend basket cases. There's a the cue. Thanks, Hilton. Oh, and Sardis, too. Uh, man, I, I really thought this was going to go the other way. Uh, so it looks like basket case is taking it. Congratulations to basket case. And now this one, I hate to just come out and say this is going to be a, a blowout. But uh, now we are moving on to the thing versus extra. I think this one's a little obvious, but we'll see. The thing versus extra. John says, who's the number one seed? Uh, we'll, we'll give it to Q on that one. So that was an upset. I don't think I'm surprised in any way that the thing is beating extra. <laughs> Quiet Rob says the thing is the underdog. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, moving down. Yeah, that was overwhelming. This one, this one I'll leave up for a little longer. This one's going to be where it gets interesting. Friday the 13th Part 3, which arguably, really great sequel, versus Halloween 3, the one without Michael Myers. Now, keep in mind, don't vote just because of the franchise. Vote based on the film itself. <laughs> you can go ahead and start voting now. I'm curious what everybody's going to say here. This is one that I think is going to come fairly close. All right. We got one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven Halloweens, two Fridays. Mitchell says part three. I've seen that. Which part three? Sardis hasn't seen either. Oh, man. Uh, that's, uh, okay. So Sardis not seeing either. I will say I, I do suggest both, but Halloween three, keep in mind is not related to Michael Myers. And it's actually a really good movie. It is. It's kind of subversive and really well acted. Um, it looks like Halloween three took it. Uh, we got, I think only three or four. Yeah. Three or four for Friday. That, that's kind of surprising. I thought that was going to be a little closer, but I, I would agree here. I think Halloween 3 is a really, really good film. Next up, this one's also going to be very difficult. Poltergeist versus Creepshow. Uh, I lean one way on these, and if you've watched the, the channel for a while, you probably know which way I lean. And the, one of the only way, reasons that I lean on this film is because uh, this film includes my last name, and I just thought that was the coolest thing when I was younger. Just not interested, Sardis. I, I get that. All right. We are showing three for Creep Show, one for Poltergeist. Mitchell hasn't finished Creep Show. Uh, two for Poltergeist, four for Creep Show, three for Poltergeist, five for Creep Show, six for Creep Show. Man, that's a lot of Creep Show. Oh, there's two more for Poltergeist. Nice. Uh oh wow. It might actually be. Okay, let's one, two, three. Four, five, six, six for creep show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for poltergeist. Poltergeist, poltergeist at the end, pulling it out. Uh, one thing I will say for poltergeist. Whoops, can't type. I think poltergeist. I mentioned this on uh, Discovering Cinema this week. I think poltergeist might have the best uh, family dynamic in any horror film ever. Uh, you know, we have Craig T. Nelson just nailing the role of a father and, and the, the parents in that. They actually love each other. It, it's so, I, I don't know, it, it's just so real. I, I love the way they did those. Okay, so that was 1982. And now we are moving on to 2002. First up, Boba, 
Can't speak. Bubba Hotep versus Dog Soldiers. I'm curious on this one because I hate, <laughs> I don't know why, I unironically hate one of these two films. I think it is slow and boring and just not great. But I, I know I'm in the minority on it. So hit me with your best shot. I've got one for each so far. One for Bubba, two for Dog Soldiers, two for Bubba. <laughs> John knows I, I hate Bubba Hotep. Three for Bubba, three for Dog Soldiers, four, five for Bubba, four for Dog Soldiers. Uh, better than the family and society? Yes, they're closer. <laughs> oh, you guys have let me down. It appears Bubba Hotep has won. I, I just, I, Nathan also hated Bubba. Nathan, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I, I can't get into Bubba Hotep. It's just so damn boring. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, this is my mom. She says, I've not seen either of those. You got to watch Dog Soldiers. It's a really good uh, werewolf film. Surprisingly well done. Next up, another intriguing one. The U.S. version of The Ring versus Juan. The original release of The Grudge. Getting into some j horror here. Let's see what everybody feels. And, and I understand uh, probably a lot of people have not seen Juon because it's it's not very easy to see. It, it hardly ever is streaming. It is uh, not uh, on Blu-ray anywhere yet. Let's see. We got uh, three for the ring, one for Juon, four for the ring. Mufasa says very scary. I agree. That's a great film. Five for the ring, three for Juon, six for the ring, four for Juon, seven for their eight. Oh man, the ring is demolishing on that one at the end there. Oh, Juwan catching up a little bit. Nice. It, it came close, but the ring US has won. No, not the US Juwan. That's the original Stendhal. It is no, it, it is the original uh, release of Juwan. And that's uh the US uh Yes, Artis, I know you're not much of a horror guy. I, I apologize. Um, yeah, the, the U.S. version of The Grudge was... I don't think it was ever called you on. Next one. Had to go to zombie films. Well, kind of zombie films here. 28 Days Later versus Resident Evil. This should be an obvious win, in my opinion. Please vote properly here. <laughs> Uh, Nathan says the Japanese ring was better. Um, I, I think they're both really good. That, that'd be a little difficult to uh, to decide if it was Japanese ring versus U.S. ring for me. I loved them both. Three, four, five, uh, six for 28 Days Later, one for Resident Evil, seven, eight. Holy cow. All right, so I think 28 Days Later has won that one. <laughs> Jeez. No, Stendhal. There's not a direct-to-video Jew on first than the theatrical. There, I was just saying it, it was the original Japanese release that I'm talking about, not the U.S. Uh, version of The Grudge. <laughs> oh. I I did not realize. I No, I was not talking about the, the direct-to-video. I was talking about the Japanese uh, Grudge. Jew on. Whatever we're calling it. Okay, 28 Days Later has smashed that one. Which it rightfully should. Uh, this one, I'm curious how many people have seen Mothman Prophecies. Uh, but this was on a lot of top lists for 2002. 2002 seemed kind of light for horror. So we have Eli Roth's original Cabin Fever. Odd that it's already been remade since that was only made in 2002. But we have Cabin Fever versus Mothman Prophecies. Uh, and I, I genuinely like, like both of these quite a lot. One, two, oh, everybody's going with Cabin Fever, which is kind of surprising. If you have not seen Mothman Prophecies, I highly recommend the imprint release of it. Uh, it is out on Blu-ray and very good. It's a really good film. Mothman was kind of a sleeper that year. We got we got one vote for Mothman at least, but uh, unfortunately, I, I got to be honest, I'd probably go with Cabin Fever here as well. 
Oh, there's another vote for Mothman. Nathan, you got to see Mothman. It, it is surprisingly good. Oh, nice. Some people at the end coming in for Mothman. Yeah, Stendhal, the, yeah, it was beat a lot. But again, we really need all of those uh, Juons coming in on Blu-ray. We don't have any of those yet. All right, so before we go into the depths of those, let's go over to the other side of the bracket. One, uh, starting heavy here, Candyman versus Bram Stoker's Dracula. Did that get erased because it was too big? There it goes. Candyman versus Bram Stoker's Dracula. Jeff hasn't seen Mothman and can't stand Roth. Man, I don't know. Roth somehow just sticks properly with me. Uh, this, uh, I got to admit, in the first round, this is one of the hardest ones that I was going to have to pick for. So I hope you guys don't tie here. <laughs> uh, we got two for Dracula, two for Candyman, four for Dracula, four for Candyman, six for Dracula, five for Candyman, seven for Dracula. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> seven for Candyman. Uh, let's see. Eight for Dracula, nine for Dracula. Sardis is only seen. Dracula, so I'm guessing that's the vote. Uh, let's see. All right, looks like Bram Stoker's Dracula wins by a hair. When I was looking at this earlier, I think that I was going to say Candyman ever so, ever so, just barely, kind of like uh, John said, by a hair. But God, both of these movies are great. Uh, if you have not seen Bram Stoker's Dracula, or if it's been a long time, first off, that 4K release looks amazing. Uh, I, I highly suggest that one uh, if you have not got that release. John, you said Candyman by hair. I agree, but Dracula beat you. Uh, next one. I feel like a lot of people may not have seen either of these. Dr. Giggles versus Raising Cain. This is another one that I think I kind of have an un unconventional pick. So hopefully you guys have seen at least one or maybe both of these. Got to vote for Raising Cain. Two for Cain. <laughs> I just noticed that when I copied the titles over the other site and it spelled wrong. <laughs> Dr. Giggles and Raising Cain. One, two, three. Mitchell's not seen either of them. Uh, Raising Cain is out from Arrow and Shout Factory, so highly suggest Raising Cain. Dr. Giggles is hard to find. Uh, one, two, three, four. We finally got a vote for Giggles from John. All right. Looks like Raising Cain has risen. All right. Next one. Again, this is where things are going to start to get a little more difficult. Alyssa in with Raising Cane as well. Man, I, I'm glad. I was going to say Raising Cane for that one too, but I thought I would, that was going to be the uh, unconventional pick. John, you son of a bitch. Do not tease me like that. I really hope so. God, that would be awesome. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Coming up. Army of Darkness versus Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Now I gotta admit, I, I think it's I think it's gonna lose by a long shot. But I think Buff, Buffy the Vampire Slayer is kind of overrated. I, I feel like it really needs to find an audience now again. Uh it, it's been quite some time, obviously. It's it's 30 years old and it you know predated the TV show and all that. But uh it, it is it is better than people give it credit for. However, it's nowhere near Army of Darkness. And uh, it looks like I've got one vote for Buffy. <laughs> Thanks, John, for speaking your truth. Oh, there's a second one for Mufasa. Everybody is all aboard the Army train. Army of Darkness. Okay. Uh, I believe we're. this is about to be the last one for 1992. Uh, and... If you've seen them, you'll know why these are uh, you'll know why these are related. Dead Alive versus 
Lawnmower Man. Please tell me many people on this channel have seen Dead Alive. I, I know it's, again, I know it's hard to find, but Dead Alive is so damn good. And, and nothing against Lawnmower Man. Uh, uh, the, you know, it, it, it had its audience, but man, Dead Alive is so, so damn fun. <laughs> Three for Dead Alive, two for Lawnmower Man. This is getting close. Four for Dead, five for Dead. Thank you, Mom. You can say my mom for voting for Dead Alive. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Six for two. I know we got some people that are on a little bit of a delay. <laughs> Seven, eight. Mitchell says, I've seen Lawnmower Man. <laughs> uh, haven't seen Dead, but I think it has to be better than Mower. Mufasa, you would you would be correct. Looks like Dead Alive is coming out. It's it's not as much of a, a murder as I expected, though. But I gotta admit, that second round, Dead Alive versus Army of Darkness, is gonna be brutal. Um seen Lawnmower, so I'm going with Dead Alive. That is a great answer, Dave. <laughs> Sardis has Lawnmower Man one and two on VHS. Wow. All right. Now, we've done 82, we've done 92, we've done 2002, so that leaves us with 2012. And unfortunately, if you were uh, paying attention in 2012, you know what some of these are going to be. It wasn't the best year for horror either. We have two that were semi-similar. VHS versus ABCs of Death. Now, both of these have their fan bases, for sure. Antoine says Dead Alive or Brain Dead. Yeah, I, I went with the US title there. I almost think I like the Brain Dead title better. Got a, two votes for VHS. <laughs> Mufasa says neither. <laughs> Got a vote for ABC. Is nice, Dave. Uh, Eric hasn't seen either. Um, I I don't want to sway it, but I'll give a I'll give a recommendation in just a second. Three for VHS, one for ABCs, four VHS. Quiet Rob says pass. Five VHS. My mom and Sardis both haven't seen either of them. Man, all right. So eight, uh, VHS wins just ever so slightly. So uh, a quick pitch here. Uh. VHS is a an, an anthology film with a, a pretty decent wraparound, uh, very low budget, uh, filmed in Missouri, filmed semi-close to me. I, I believe it was filmed in Columbia, Missouri, and uh, it was surprisingly, like, really good. There is, I think, three short stories, if I'm remembering right, and the second one, again, hoping that my memory is not fuzzy here, I believe the second one is, like, surprisingly uh, spooky. Really well made. Um, the sequels really start to fall apart there. ABC's of Death. Uh, a couple of them were were good. Uh, in fact, uh, I would even say a couple of them are better than all of VHS. However, as a whole, ABC's of Death really fell apart for me. Um, so much that I've not seen the sequel at all. It, does, has anybody else seen the sequel for ABC's of Death? I don't know if that one's worth it, but... Uh, ABC's one, it, it's, it's worth it to stream once if you're bored, but VHS, I, I agree with the chat. VHS is a, a much better film itself. And, and even though many people are saying pass, I would say VHS is worth the watch. Let's move on to some better stuff. Sinister versus cabin in the woods. This is a really, really difficult pairing. I'm curious as hell to see what you guys pick here. This is one uh, that, God, I, I kind of wish this had been a second rounder because these are two really difficult titles to choose from. Ethan Hawke is freaking amazing and sinister. And then Cabin in the Woods, uh, a lot of people think it's literally a perfect film, which I don't really agree with that. But uh, yeah, both of these are great. All right. We have four for Cabin, one for Sinister, five for Cabin, six for Cabin. Wow. Wow. I didn't think this was going to be such a blowout. I got to be honest. Seven for Cabin. Nathan, I was going to say that. 
uh fart was amazing fart was really good that's a i never expected to say that sentence on stream <laughs> lissa thank you another vote for sinister i think that's only two though all right third thank you john man john we are on the page so much on the same page. All right. Uh, unfortunately, Sinister only got three votes. So Cabin in the Woods ran away with it. I, I did expect that one to win, but I don't think it's as, as clear of a runaway as that. Uh, here's where we get some uh, some controversy. Lords of Salem. Oh, Nathan said Sinister as well. Nice. Uh, Lords of Salem versus Paranorman. And I know that I've got a lot of people on here who hate Rob Zombie. But I think Lords of Salem is probably, it's hard to say, but it, it's up there as one of his best couple films. I really liked Lords of Salem. All right, we got two for Paranorman, one for Lords, three for Paranorman, three for Lords, coming out as a tie at the moment. Four for Paranorman. Paranorman is actually a really good film, too. Want. Still tied four and four. Paranormal or Paranorman is animated, yes. Stendhal says it's his best work. I I I hesitate to say that, but it's it's pretty damn close. It is up there with the devil's rejects for me. And honestly, House of a Thousand Corpses might still be my favorite. Quiet Rob says I'm gonna hate myself for this. Why? The Lords of Salem is good. One, two, oh man, Paranorman, <laughs> Nathan says Paranorman by a mile. Oh, Mitchell, you, you gotta, you gotta change that. You gotta watch both of those. Paranorman is surprisingly good. And remember, it's a, it's a Leica film. So the animation is top notch. All right. Paranorman has advanced to the second round. And now to find out who he will be facing. We got, I believe only two more left to choose from. Kill List, without a space. Kill List and the Snowtown Murders. I feel like this is going to be the least watched pair of films on this entire thing. Uh, Snowtown, uh, or uh, yeah, in the, in the UK, it's only called Snowtown. And in the US, it was the Snowtown Murders. That just got a release from uh, 101 Films. Kill List is a, uh, like a folk horror type of uh, film at the end. We've got one for each, two for Kill List. No, a lot of people haven't seen either of these. Mitchell's never even heard of either of these. Wow. Man, uh, so Kill List is wild. It starts off as a very dramatic crime drama, and then out of nowhere, it gets turned on its head in the weirdest of ways. It's got some brutal kills, and it turns into like this weird folk ritualistic killing at the end, but it is so shocking. Some people hate it because of the abrasive turn, but it is, it is uh, directed by Ben Wheatley and he does really great work in that film. Um, highly, highly suggest kill list. Uh, let's see. We, we've got two for kill list and one for the Snowtown murders. I mean, kill list wins, but I, I think it's for a lack of votes here. Snowtown's actually really good as well. All right, going to the second level of these. So, moving on. Basket Case versus The Thing. 1982's tough end to this one. I'm expecting to see a lot more votes now. <laughs> I assume many more people have seen The Thing in Basket Case than Kill List. Flickering voted for Basket Case. Nice. Way to be honest in the counterculture. John, we have never talked about Basket Case. And I know, I just because I know you, I knew that you loved Basket Case. That's great. All right. So this one is going to The Thing. Not, not very shocking, but it's there. 
Okay. Uh, for those that have seen both, this one I I feel like is still going to be pretty tough. Halloween 3 versus Poltergeist. Halloween 3 and Poltergeist. Uh, two very well-made films. Again, uh, really, really good um, for the year that they came out. Five, wow. Five for Halloween 3, three for Poltergeist, six for Halloween 3, four for Poltergeist, seven and five, eight and five. This one's close. Eight and six, eight and seven. Tied at Mitchell, eight and eight. Poltergeist taking the lead there at the end with nine. Is that it from everybody? Because if that's the case, Poltergeist just... Uh, oh, nope, there's Nathan. Tied it up, nine to nine. If there's anybody else waiting in the wings, this is the perfect time to break a tie. This is... Man, that is dramatic. Nine to nine there. We've still got 20 other people on the stream that haven't answered. All right. That means I'm going to have to give a final vote. And I, damn it. This is what I don't really know where to go on this one. Oh. I'm going to have to go with the heart pick, not the head pick here. I, I think Poltergeist is the better film. But Halloween 3 is going to have to win it. I, uh, any day of the week, I think I'd rather watch Halloween 3 than Poltergeist. It is such a great movie. And uh, I I'm letting my mom down. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, moving on down to 2002, Bubba Hotep versus The Ring US. Bubba Hotep versus... Oh, John's not a big fan of Poltergeist, huh? I, th I mean, it's sort of by the books for, for that time. Mufasa, I scared you. <laughs> yes, Sardis, my poor taste decides. Uh, two for ring, one for Bubba, three for ring, four, five for ring, three for Bubba, four for Bubba. The song from Halloween 3 is great. Damn. More are coming in than I thought on this one. So... Two to one, three to one, four to one, five to one, five to two, five to three, six to three, six to four, five, seven to five, eight to five, eight to six, eight to seven, nine to seven. It looks like the ring is barely winning. Nathan vote? Yes, he did. Okay, nine to seven. Wow. I got to be honest. I kind of thought Boba was going to take that one. Moving down, I, I think this is going to be an obliteration here. 28 days later against Cabin Fever. I feel like since everybody just seems to hate Eli Roth, this is going to go down in flames. But I also don't think that this should really be a, a contest because 28 days later is a much better film. <laughs> and so agrees every single person <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> oh man, that was a uh, that was maybe the most brutal beating so far tonight. <laughs> Jeez, he can go eat some pancakes. Amen to that. All right, let's get into the second round. <laughs> Uh, second round for 1992. Uh, John says, I do love Green Inferno. A little secret here. I don't think I've seen Green Inferno yet. I know I really need to. But I, I know that it's, yeah. I don't know. I, I have no excuse. Uh, okay. Bram Stoker's Dracula versus Raising Cain. 
three to one, four to one, five to one. Mufasa says Green Inferno was gross. Five to two. Yeah, John, I'll, I'll add it up on my list. I've been meaning to watch it for a long time. Six to two, seven to two, eight to two, nine to two. Drac is running away with this one. Not not as big of a win as uh, the last one. Still a big win. Everybody's loving that one. All right, here's where it gets brutal. Super curious about this one. Army of Darkness versus Dead Alive. And again, those of you that have not seen Dead Alive, you have to watch Dead Alive. Because I, I think it's the easy choice here to say Army of Darkness because it's such a cult classic favorite. But Dead Alive, I mean, Dead Alive is amazing. <laughs> All right, we got two for each, three, four, five, six, seven for Army, two for Dead Alive, three for Dead Alive, eight, nine. Ah, and so it happens. Army of Darkness obliterates Oops. Dead Alive. Wait, wait, wait. Take out the diarrhea, and then I'm good with Inferno. There was diarrhea? What? What? That is not what I expect in the cannibal film. <laughs> I wow. All right, moving on to 2012. Again, this is going to be a completely obliteration here. VHS versus Cabin in the Woods. Mitchell says spoilers. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think this one's going to be any surprise at all. Cabin in the woods across the board. John likes them both. He at least had to uh, argue internally. Everybody's going cabin, though. All right, next one. Oh, again, a lot of people haven't seen either of these. So this is going to be a tough one. Paranorman versus Kill List. Paranorman. <laughs> these are such weird movies to pair together here. <laughs> Paranorman versus Kill List, an animated fun film from Leica Studios. First, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, more people have seen Paranorman. I should not be surprised by this. <laughs> Thanks, Antoine, for voting for what is easily, I, I think, the better film. Uh, wow. Uh, Lisa, you too. Awesome. The, this is this is sad that I have to write Paranorman here. It's a great movie. I agree. But Kill List is so much better. All right, we're going to go in reverse order for this uh, trip around the board. Hilton says Kill List as well. So we got we got like three or four at least. But now, I, Paranorman is going to get smashed here, probably. Paranorman versus Cabin in the Woods. We are down to eight. Nathan is voting for Paranorman. Oh, wow. This is a little more split than I expected. Four, four and four, five and four, eight and four. Now it's going a little more cabin. I mean, Paranorman is, is good, but it's not cabin in the woods good. And Nathan is ride or die for Paranorman. It, it was semi close. Paranorman almost took that one. All right, the next version of the Elite Eight. Ooh, here we go. Bram Stoker's Dracula versus Army of Darkness. Two that you all have been hot on tonight. 
<laughs> Sardis. <laughs> Up till now, th now, thought it was paranormal. No, the the kid's name is Norman, so it's paranormal. One for Drac, two for Army, three for Army, two for Drac, four for Army, three for Drac, four for Drac. We're tied. Five, six for Drac, five for Army. Wow, seven for Drac. How many is that for Army? Did I lose count? One, two, three, four, five. Six for army, seven for army. Coraline is better. Nathan, I agree. Uh, let's see. Drac has one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Not are we really tied nine and nine again? Man, did I count that right? Is anybody else counting too? I, I think that was nine versus nine. Oh, there's a Nathan vote. Okay, ten. Bram Stoker's Dracula wins by one. By one. That one, honestly, is kind of shocking to me. All right, let's go from the bottom up. 28 days later. Versus the Ring US. 28 days later. <laughs> Love that comment, John. Listen up, you primitive screwheads. Sardis is grateful, Nate. <laughs> uh, 28 with two, Ring with two. Four or five. Oh, wow. There's a lot of 28 days later in a row there. Nine for 28 and two for the ring. Oh, man. I honestly thought that was going to be a lot closer. Still coming in for 28. Jeez. Uh, I do. I do admit I love 28 days later. I, I think it's an incredible movie. All right. Let's make it interesting. In 1982, The Thing versus Halloween 3. 19 days later in seven days. <laughs> oh, Mufasa. That was a good one. Yeah, this is exactly how I saw this going. Eight, nine for the thing and nothing for Halloween 3. Sardis, I still say you should watch Halloween 3. Whew. Again, I didn't think this was going to be 100%. Oh, it's not 100%. My mom came in and got a Halloween 3. Damn. So wait, my mom voted for Poltergeist over Halloween 3, but then she chose Halloween 3 over The Thing. So you think Poltergeist is better than The Thing? Are we actually related? Yeah. All right. So we're going to jump to the other side and go with this one first. We have Bram Stoker's Dracula. I wish I... Or I can zoom out a little bit. Let me do that. Zooming out. Here we go. These are the final four here. Bram Stoker's Dracula versus Cabin in the Woods. 1992's Bram Stoker's Dracula versus 2012's Cabin in the Woods. Coming in three for Cabin, one for Brom. Three versus two. Three versus three. Three versus four. Four versus four. Five, four, five, five. Six for Cabin. Six for Drac. Seven for Drac. 
This is close. Couch got it seven to six right now for Dracula. Eight to six with Lissa. Whoo. Man. Whoops. I went the wrong way. You guys are uh, making me proud tonight. I, I really did not think that this one would beat Cabin in the Woods. Nine for Dracula. <laughs> he traveled over three oceans of time not to lose to silly old cabin in the woods. That's funny. All right. We have a representative from this side. Bam Stoker's Dracula. Well, let's see if this one is close at all. The Thing versus 28 Days Later. The Thing from 1982 versus 2002's 28 Days Later. Jeez. We got one vote for 28 days so far. Oh, two and three for Mufasa. Mitchell, have you never seen the thing? There's four. Uh, fourth one from Lissa. All right, all. Unfortunately, it wasn't really that close. But now... The hardest uh, overall, oh man, you have never seen it. You got to watch the thing. Uh, and that, if you don't have it and you are 4K capable, that new 4K is surprisingly great. Universal did amazing with it. Uh, detail in that release is incredible. Okay. This is it, everybody. The Thing versus Bram Stoker's Dracula. 1982 versus 1992. Let's hear it. Final votes. Two for the thing so far. With the way everybody's been defending Drac, I'm expecting some. Oh, Mufasa saw the thing in 70 mil a couple years ago. That's fantastic. Uh, one for Drac, three thing, one Drac, four, five, six things, three Dracs, seven things, four Dracs, five Dracs, eight things, nine things. John says it was over before it began. The thing. 10, 11, 12. Woo! All right. Another vote for Dracula. But overall, it appears that it was over before it began. The thing is tonight's winner. With our 40 years of horror anniversary turn tournament, Still more votes coming in for the thing. You guys are awesome. I, I, I kind of figured that it was going to end with that winning, but I did not see some of these going down uh, the way they did. So just, just to share what some of my picks were going to be, um, for me, Creepshow would have beat Poltergeist. Uh, Dog Soldiers definitely would have beat uh, Bubba Hotep. Cinematic, you caught the main reason why I chose to do this today. Today is Kurt Russell's birthday. Yes. Uh, I think for me, the ring also would have won, but it would have been just barely. Uh, again, Cabin Fever probably just barely would have beat Mothman. Uh, up here for me, I think Candyman would have beat Bram Stoker's Dracula, even though they're both great. Uh, Raising Kane beats Do Dr. Giggles all day. Fully agree. Uh, let's see. Lords of Salem would have won for me over Paranorman. And I think most everything else probably would have went similar to the way that you guys voted. Uh, <laughs> my mom says meteor shit. Uh, for those that don't know the Stephen King portion of creep show at the beginning, his name is Jordy Verrill, And my last name is Verrill. So I've, I've always loved that. I've got a, uh, a, a uh, what is it called? Like a, a rain slicker or a windbreaker or something like that. Uh, I've got a little jacket that's got uh, Jordy Verrill, his name on it. And on the back, it says uh, meteor shit. 
I, I love creep show. I think it's one of the greats, but I hope uh, that was fun for everybody. Figured I would show it off a little bit. This show promotions can influence people's choice so much. Hype this year over the 4K release. Uh, that's true. And uh, the thing in 4K was great, but I, I got to be honest. If you are choosing to get something tonight after watching all this, Bram Stoker's Dracula in 4K, if you do not have that yet, absolutely, absolutely jump on that because it is an incredible release. It looks great. Uh, Mufasa, they, they're just, uh, Sardis was talking about our Thursday shows that we're here live every Thursday. Uh, do I like the new creep show? It is, I mean, obviously it's an anthology, so some are a lot better than others, but overall, I, I think it's surprisingly decent. I, th I think that they've done a good job and I'm glad that it's still going. I was really hoping that it got a second season and I, I honestly didn't expect it to. So the fact that it's still going is great. Um, yes. So if I was going to recommend anything that we talked about tonight, uh, most people had not seen Kill List. I will recommend that one. Absolutely recommend that one. Uh, again, lots of you had not seen that. It is uh, a wild uh, movie. The uh, you know the, the first third is going to feel a little odd, and then it really takes off. Kill List is really good. Ben Wheatley killed it with that movie. Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula in 4K. Dead Alive. If you can find a copy of Dead Alive and you've never seen it, highly recommend that one. Um, Lords of Salem. Give that one another watch for everybody. Uh, I I highly recommend it for sure. Um, it is... I don't think it's very Rob Zombie-esque. I think it's actually a very good modern horror film. Surprisingly well done. And I, I know everybody hates that Sherry Moon Zombie is in everything that he does. She kills it in that movie. She she is absolutely well casted and uh, does great in that role. Stendhal fully agree. Stendhal says Coppola's Dracula is like watching a gothic painting. It is gorgeous. Oh, the thing in Creepshow would have been a good matchup. Unfortunately, we didn't get there. Damn poltergeist. Um, last thing I will comment, uh, before we go tonight, um, I did mention the next three weeks, we have some big guests coming, please come back for those. But one more thing, uh, I did start a Patreon race recently for the channel. I am putting out exclusive videos over there as well. But one of the big reasons to join that is I'm doing a nice giveaway every single month. And the cutoff for that is going to be the 20th of every, um, every month. So if you want in on that giveaway, as part of that, and you're going to join up on that tier, make sure you sign up now, like before Sunday, so that I can get you in there for the live drawing that we're going to do. Uh, the live drawing should be next Monday, so I can get a package out to somebody for free. And uh, yeah, it's going to be good. I'm sending out two this month. Uh, if you signed up first under my Patreon, you are getting something special. And I, I've already told that person, so you know if it was you. Uh, my mom's asking, what year did Kill List come out? That was 2012. 2012. And it's a... Uh, it's a UK film, I think. UK or Ireland? Quiet Rob, do you know offhand what Kill List? Uh, I, I think it came from somewhere over there. Ben Wheatley, I believe, is a UK director. Uh, Kill List was in 2011 in the UK, but in the US, it was 2012. The theatrical release for that was not until 2012. Uh, th there's a couple of those that were odd, like technically Cabin in the Woods premiered in 2011 uh, at a couple festivals, but then didn't actually play wide until 2012. So the, the year in IMDb is going to be listed a little bit differently on some of those. But we got to look at the wide releases when everybody could see them. All right. So like I said, uh, come back the next three weeks. We got some big guests. Um, I'm going to be revealing next week's uh, probably this weekend. And if you're on the Patreon, you're going to know very soon because I, I, I think I'm telling everybody in the Patreon tonight or uh, tomorrow. A uh, new video coming out tomorrow and then some stuff on Vinegar Syndrome next week is their big pre-sale. So we're going to be talking about Vinegar Syndrome a lot. I appreciate you all hanging out tonight. And uh, speaking of Patreon, I wanted to shout out everybody that is currently a patron. 
You guys are helping the channel quite a lot. Thank you so much for what you do. And all that being said, uh, tonight was a lot of fun. If you guys want more stuff like this, let me know in the comments below. That was uh, it was fun to put together. I think that it it was uh, pretty well pretty well done. And I even was typing some of those out as we were doing the announcements. That was pretty good. Uh, all right. All that being said, uh, have a good night and uh, appreciate you guys. Thanks for hanging out from one collector to all of you. See you next time.